Okay. Welcome everybody to this afternoon's meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, just verbally respond so we know that you can be heard. Um, Nat? I am here. Tammy? Tammy? I'm here. Okay, thanks. Jean? Here. Okay, and I'm here. Austin is here. Okay, I know of no changes or additions to the agenda. Our first item of business is the approval of minutes uh, from July 15th, August 6th, and September 6th. Uh, is Let's go through them serially. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of uh, July 15th? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? I second, and I have a comment. Okay, oh. so comments on the minutes. Oh, um, uh, sorry, Mike. Uh, I don't have a comment on the July one. Oh, okay. So, is there any um, corrections to the July minutes? Okay. So, uh, on the question of whether to approve the July minutes, Nat. Yes. Tammy. Yes. Jean. Yes. Lee Edwards? Yes. Okay. And Austin votes yes. Okay. Next is um, August 6th. Uh, motion to approve the minutes of August 6th. So moved. so moved. Okay. Since I heard two so moved, I'll take one of them to be a second. Okay. Any uh, discussion of the minutes of August 6th? Oh, um, so one uh, minor point, and Lee can confirm this, but the Pickleball discussion, um, I think, was not in the capital campaign line. It was under the annual fund line, so that can be moved. Thank you. Anything else but the minutes of August 6th? Okay, on the question of approving the minutes of August 6th. Uh, yes. Tammy? Yes. Jean? Yes. Lee? Okay, you're muted, Lee, but okay. Uh, and Austin votes yes. Okay, next are the minutes of September 6th. Motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion or changes to the minutes of September 6th. Uh, another minor, minor pickleball point, but I think what um, Lee said was that the pickleball seeks over 100 participants, not Thank you. has over 100. Can you hear me? Yes, Lee. Okay, yeah, I was going to make that point also. Uh, right. Okay. Seeks. Got it. Okay, anything else on those minutes? Okay, on the approval of the minutes, Nat? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Jean? Yes. Lee? Yes. And Austin votes yes. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, next item on our agenda is public comment. Over here. Any member of the public wish to make a comment? It would be great if you raised your virtual hand. Okay, I see one member of the public wishes to make a comment. Thank you. Um, please bring Arlie into the Zoom. Arlie? Hi. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you for coming. Um, good afternoon. I just want to let you know, I'm feeling really sad about the demolition aspect of the project. Um, and the analogy that came into my mind, while not perfect, is imagine if someone said, oh, we're going to demolish a few of the Civil War tablets and we'll take some pictures, you know, and, and that'll be as good. Because I saw the Jones Library Building uh, Commission agenda and it says mitigation measures. And it sounds like you're going to take pictures of all the things you demolish and anyway if you know that's the way it feels to me and I could imagine demolishing some of the civil war tablets would feel terrible so 
just so you know, this friendly naysayer, stinker person, that's how I feel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your comment. Okay, I see one other member of the public that wishes to make a comment. Uh, Lou, bring Lou into the room. Lou. Yes. I would like to know if the approved bidders for the library demolition and expansion project have been informed that the historic preservation elements have not yet been uh, decided on, that there's a meeting going to happen. And if and when that does happen, there will have to be changes to the work order. Have they been informed? And if not, when will they be informed? That's your question? That is. Do you have anything else? Uh, at the moment, no. All right, thanks so much. Okay, any other member of the public? I have one more. Okay, Rob. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Okay, sorry. Thank, thanks, uh, Austin. Um, th this, uh, how much time do I have? Is this a question or is this a comment? Two, Two minutes. minutes. Two okay, minutes. I think I can keep it shorter. They would so, be more. I, yeah, I, uh, well, I'll, I'll be polite. Yeah, so so Rob Custer from 40, 49 Van Meter Drive and happened to be in Berkeley, California this 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 month. Um, I have four quick things that pertain more generally to the process. Um, let me see if I can do them in order. The first is that the 106 hearing is coming on very soon. Very quickly, and I believe, and I've checked with uh, some well-versed attorneys in this, that there is a 14-day notification period for such a hearing. Unlike uh, town of Amherst municipal meetings that require about a 48-hour notice, and I don't believe that's been met, and so I'm concerned about that step in the process. I I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure we've got a problem there, folks. Um, the second thing is a similar procedural issue. And I'm concerned about the, the asymmetry and frankly inequity in as much as there are about a dozen uh, consulting parties identified for that process. 11 of them seem to be rather closely aligned uh, with each other and with the proponents. And I'm not saying one is more meritorious than the other, but there's apparently one slot that's been slated for the Amherst Historic Preservation Coalition. And what that means is it leads to a, an 11 to 1 ratio in the time allotted to make presentations on you know, either merits or, or concerns about the project. And I think that is a matter of equity and may also lead to further issues in the future. So I, I, I don't know whether you guys can do anything about that, but I just want to make you aware of that. The remaining two are more uh, structural or physical uh, things that I'm concerned about. I think others will, will ask of these two. And this has to do with the extent to which the adjoining, adjoining or neighboring uh, budding stronghouse is going to be protected. Um, my understanding is that when the somewhat modest addition in 1960 was done, and that was, I think, completely removed with the 1990s addition, uh, there was a uh, vibrational effect from uh, some of the construction activity. I don't know if they were driving piles to found, put you know, better foundations there. The area behind the library and the area that then becomes the what's now the CVS, I think then it was probably the Louis Foods parking lot. Um, there has been obviously excavation work there, but it's also an area that's wet and that may have trouble with that driving pilings, doing other types of work that is inherently vibrating and can damage dry stone foundations. And my understanding is that the Stronghouse Foundation was potentially damaged. It had to be braced up, shored up for this, the very modest 1960s work. And I think this might become a problem in the future if this project goes forward and the extent to which it's now proposed. 
And I don't believe that contractors are aware of that potential. If they are, it should be really explicit in the contract. And whatever liability they might have for um, making whole the strong house, should it turn out to be not as strong as its name might suggest, that needs to be spelled out really carefully in terms of level of bonding, liability. Finally, there's an issue of um, much more ancient, sort of prehistoric entities that may or may not uh, be present either on site or on, in the easement that Amherst Historical Society owns by the strong house. This part of town was above the level of Lake Hitchcock as far as my own topographic research is done, but near the shoreline. And so it's very likely that cultural artifacts. I've heard that the, I believe it's the Mass Historical Commission, but maybe I'm mistaken, the entity has yet to release, at least to the public, information about that. It may be they're trying to protect, you know, very sensitive sites and artifacts, but that needs to be looked into more carefully before you right. guys go. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for your comment. Okay. Public comment is now closed. All right. Uh, item number five. So we have in the packet a letter uh, to the Amherst Historical Society and Museum. And uh, we need a board vote to approve sending this letter. Um, it's sent to Liz Larson, executive director of the Amherst Historical Society. On behalf of the Jones Library Board of Trustees, I write to confirm the Jones Library's ar um, archaeological survey will be conducted in part on Amherst Historic Society Museum property as part of the Jones Library expansion and renovation project. I acknowledge that the Board of the Amherst Historical Society Museum agrees to allow this survey to be conducted on the Amherst Historical Society and Museum property, with the understanding that any non-Indigenous objects found will be returned to the Amherst Historical Society Museum after analysis by the Commonwealth. The Board of the Amherst Historical Society and Museum will also receive a copy, digital and hard, of any reports or findings of the survey for its records. And the Amherst Historical Society Museum is welcome to photograph and post pictures of the law work being conducted on its website and or social media outlets. Thank you for your time and consideration. So that's the letter. If there's a motion to approve the sending of this letter and a second, then we would uh, entertain um, any comments. Is there a motion to approve sending the letter? So moved. Thank you, Lee. Is there a second? Gene, you're muted. Seconded. Thank, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, yep, Nat. I will have to recuse myself since I am married to the executive director. Thank you. Okay, any discussion of this um, letter? Okay, on the question of approving sending the letter, Tammy? Yes. Thank you, Jean? Yes. Lee? Yes. And Austin votes um, yes, uh, with noting that Nat recused himself. Okay, next are committee reports. Uh, the Library Building Committee, uh, I don't remember whether the Library Building Committee met uh, after our last meeting before this one, but in any case, we had a Library Building Committee. We reviewed uh, yet again the proposed changes that uh, were incorporated in the value engineering um, activity that we, uh, that we undertook. We reviewed the permitting process uh, the reviews that had gone on in the um, in the uh, in in the town. Uh, the good news is that our project is out for bid, uh, and the bids uh, from the general contractors are due on the thirty first of October, I believe, at two p.m. Is that is that right, Sharon? Um, so that's very good news, and I want to thank Sharon and. Uh, uh, Bob Parent 
uh, for the work that was needed to be done. FAA did, a, I think, a terrific job, was very responsive um, in getting us to this point. And the point is that now the project is out for, uh, for bid. Um, the 106 process is in place. Uh, the town uh, has provided a, a preliminary letter about adverse effects, which is very detailed. Uh, about uh, what the 106 process will involve and what the potential adverse effects um, are. As was noted in the public comment, we will have a meeting uh, to uh, with consulting parties uh, to hear what folks have to say. That meeting uh, will be facilitated by an outside facilitator to make sure that um, everybody has their uh, chance to speak. Uh, I think it's on October 9th from 12:30 to 3:30 is what the uh, what the plan for that uh, what the plan for that is. Uh, any any questions about the building project? We have been in close communication with the historic society. We have been in. Uh, extensive discussions to make sure that they were fully informed uh, about uh, any any possible concerns. Uh, we've worked with them uh, to get to the point where they're, I think, satisfied with what it is that we are um, what it is that we are proposing. What it is that we are proposing to do. Okay. Any questions? We, of course, don't know where the bids will come in. Uh, we don't really know how many of, I think there were five, five submissions for pre-qualification and four general contractors were uh, pre-qualified. Uh, you know, we, we're waiting to see how many of them will actually submit, uh, submit bids. Okay, and nothing else on the building committee. All right, let's go to buildings and what? Well, Austin, please. I, I mean, I could bring this up in development, but maybe it's more proper the building committee. And this is um, a rumor that I have heard, but I've heard it now from several people that um, people opposed to the project have been in contact with contractors urging them not to bid. And as I say, it's only a rumor and I don't even know how to follow up on it. And it's not even really a library project. It's a town project. And maybe I'm naive, but I was shocked. That's all, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Lee. Sharon, have you heard anything about this? Uh, only what Lee has has said um you know we had a nice turnout for the walkthrough and you know all i all i can say is you know these are businesses they you know they're going to do what's best for their businesses and the the misinformation that's out there is not i, I don't think it will fluster them you know the these contractors have have rehabilitated historic properties before so um i don't I don't think we need to worry. Okay. Do you want to just say a word about the walkthrough? Uh, so I I wasn't a part of it. It was George and Bob Parent, but yes. Um, so, you know, we didn't know whether or not to expect people because, um, you know, everybody had been there already, but because the scope of the project has changed, everybody came and asked questions and yeah, the process is going really smoothly. So it's always nice to get those one-on-one -on -one chats with people. Thank you. That's great to hear. And thank you, Lee. Thanks for the thanks for raising the question. Uh, so Sharon, without part, um, what is the pleasure about buildings and facilities? Are you going to talk about it or? Oh, oh, oh! I I was not prepared. Um, and who is the other person along with Farah? Is it Tammy? I was going to say Eugene, but it's not Eugene. No, I, I, I have not done the minutes yet. I can try to tell you a little bit about what happened. Great. Um, the monthly 
building and grounds report, George said nothing new to report. Um, they're going to be changing to heating, and um, there may be some problems with that. Um, the state boiler inspection was required, some minor adjustments. Um, AC, um, some areas had to use fans because the AC wasn't working. Um, one of the elevators had a problem with water in the shaft. Um, the back of the building is clay, so there were some issues. Um, and a tree fell near the CVS building next to the shed, but didn't do any damage. Hold on. <laughs> I'm reading out of notes, so I'll do the best right. I can. Thanks, Tim. Um, uh, the limb landed on the shed and the cooling tower, but there was no damage. Um, they called the tree warden and he came and took care of it. Um, uh, in the basement, there's been lots of vaping. There's no oversight of the basement, so that's a problem. Uh, kids coming, um, when the school's let out, there are some teens in the, in the basement. Um, as far as the backup building project, um, there are, we're ready with RFPs um, uh, to look for, um, in other words, nothing's been done yet, but we, if, if we need to, we would um, take the proper steps. And part of that would be an RFP to an architect to look at issues like um, uh, repairing the HVAC, the fire uh, suppression system, asbestos in the children's room. Mm -hmm. um, those are the, the major things that would be done. Um, and that's, um, we're waiting for the town to reply as far as the steps needed for the RFP. Uh, the town just hired a new finance director, so that will be helpful. Um, if bids not accepted, we will meet with Paul and get a feasibility study from an architect and proceed with those first um, major um, repairs. And that's sort of it. Um, Anything else, Tammy? That, yeah, that's pretty much it. One thing is the old, we have a new delivery van, which has been terrific, it's electric. And the old library van was sold. Um, so uh, George is very happy with the new van. So that's pretty much it. Um, Laura might have done a better job, but I was just looking at the minutes right. which I took. Okay. An electric van, is there a charging? Where, where, where do they charge it? Yeah, we have a, a just a plug at the shed. It's fabulous. <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of downscale charging station, a plug yeah. at the shed. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Any other questions for buildings and facilities? So it is great, Tammy. And again, I appreciate the work that you've done and far has done and George has done and Sharon has done that we are in position to think if the bids uh, don't come in in a way that the project can go forward, that we're in a position to move um as expeditiously as we can to deal with some of the uh, issues in the building. And that is really great to hear. Okay. Item number C, development committee. All right. Well, I regret to say that the person who does the, you know, the tallying and uh, for the two reports that I usually bring uh, is ill and was not able to get to them for this month. So on that, I don't have anything particular to report, although I think as Nat mentioned a little bit earlier, um, in terms of the annual fund or in terms of what's coming into the friends to benefit the library, um, uh, it's, going, it's going quite well. There are a lot of sponsors and uh, we're particularly grateful to People's Bank who are the lead sponsor for uh, this tournament um, and who've been very supportive of us 
uh, in the past. So uh, that's all good. And um, uh, no, no, I, I'll wait for the right two items down as the budget committee. That's all that I have to say about the development committee. Um, any any questions for Lee? So I have two questions, Lee. One is about the pickleball event. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask if the trustees are sponsoring a whole, but I know that that's the wrong. A court. court. A court. A court. Uh, we are sponsoring a court. Yes, a pickleball court. There are two sponsors for each, or at least potentially, there are two sponsors for each court, and the trustees will be one of two sponsors on one court. That's the, now you know everything I know about pickleball. Well, it's better than saying sponsoring a whole. That it is. That's true. <laughs> Lee, have people signed up to participate yet? Yes, they have. So yes, you were seeking one hundred, right? Oh. Well, that would be the maximum that we could okay. uh, that we could deal with. Yeah. And do you want to just remind us, uh, just as many times as we can, when the pickleball tournament is? It's the last Sunday in October. Last Sunday in October. Yeah, yeah. And just again, since I don't have a report here, um, when we went to the arrangement with the friends, we said the annual fund would be divided. 80-20. And we also sp specified in the MOA that any that the annual fund meant any contributions that came in either completely unrestricted, you know, in response to nothing or in response to an appeal that was sent out for the annual fund. Any funds that came in because the library did something on its own, had an event or sold something, or the friends had an event or sold merchandise or had a book sale, whatever, would be not subject to the 80-20 split. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe we'll find a way to break out these two, or otherwise people will just have to understand that what's reported in the annual fund is money that comes in for the benefit of the library in any given year in an unrestricted way. And then internally we'll sort out how that's distributed, but it's all, if it's not restricted by the donor, benefit where the friends in the library think the funds are needed most. My other question just is, can you say anything uh, about the uh, kind of atmosphere that you are encountering when you are soliciting gifts for the capital campaign or people? What is the, if, if, is there anything that you can say? I can say that we have... <laughs> that we are going around and explaining um, a very complicated situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we explain it, the people we explain it to uh, understand. On the other, you know, that's the upside. On the, you know, on the downside, uh, the atmosphere is very, um, it, it's not usual to have a capital campaign where there's a substantial, amount of publicity opposing the capital campaign. Yeah. And it's as though if you were at the university trying to do a capital campaign, people were saying, well, really what you should do is close the college. So uh, it's a challenge, but yeah. we're doing the best we can. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And maybe this is a question for Sharon and maybe it just reflects my catastrophic thinking if someone hurts themselves at the pickleball event. Oh, we're insured. That's what I want to make sure. Yes. No, absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you, Lee. Thanks for the work. We're insured with a local insurer. Okay, way to go. <laughs> okay, uh, next is the report from the Personnel Planning and Policy Committee. Okay, I'd like to first um, make a motion to approve the library director's FY25 step increase. And then once that, I will give some background right. and information. Okay, Tammy is making a motion to approve the library director's FY25 step increase. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you. Tammy, you want to say a little bit about it? Okay. Um, because I serve on the personnel board, I, I was, um, you know, found out about the town non-union pay scale. Mm -hmm. And um, the town manager said this was long overdue um, and that many staff, uh, town staff are underpaid in comparison with other towns. Um, as a result, um, when when people were placed on the new scale when it first came out in uh, FY24, they were placed um, on the new scale above what they were making. Now, some people got a couple thousand dollars. Sharon only got $500. Um, now, the scale changed with some cost of living adjustments for July 24. So that's the FY25. And so she went up uh, another thousand. Um, but we discussed this in, um, I conferred with her and we discussed this in PPP. And we think that she should um, be increased from uh, where she is at step five to step eight on the new scale. Um, and that would mean she would, um, the new scale would be 129.683, if I'm reading, or 583. Um, we did find out from the HR director that some of the staff members, they're on a scale above her, but that most of them are now on step nine or 10, and they earn uh, $20,000 more um, than Sharon. And Sharon is considered one of the you know, six or a seventh uh, position that requires the most qualifications. Mm -hmm. So we are recommending that on the FY uh, uh, 25 scale, she uh, goes from step eight, I mean, step five to step um, eight. So that's, um, um, this is a three-step increase, which we felt in PPP was entirely justified. Um, uh, going up steps is it in recognition of um, exemplary, excellent, um, exceptional work. Um, for some town employees, the, the limit is two, but we're not confined by that. Um, and I think that given everything that Sharon does to manage the library services, the branches, um, programs, not to mention all of the um, building, the project um, that's been going on now for eight or eight years plus, I'm not sure how many years that she's just added that to her regular job description. So, um, that is the motion um, from the PPP. Okay. So oh, questions, Nat? Yeah, I have a question since I'm kind of new on the board. Um, is this something that just the trustees can approve or does it then need to go to the town manager or how does that work? Well, um, it goes, the, the trustees would approve it. Um, the town manager would have to implement it. Um, it's not a huge amount of money to add to the budget. It's actually less than some other people got from their regular step increases. Basically, step increases um, and changing levels happens on the anniversary of the person's employment. And Sharon started in early October. Matt, did that answer your question? Okay, other questions for Tammy. So Tammy, I have a few questions. Okay. First of all, I want to thank the PPP for um, reviewing this situation and uh, connecting with the town. I, that that's very helpful to hear. Can you can you give us a sense of what other library directors uh, make who are in a position like Sharon's? Now I know that's uh, difficult. Uh, it's difficult to find the comp in the sense of people who've been in place for 
uh, the same amount of time that Sharon's been and run uh, comparable uh, libraries? Well, there is a list that I printed out that I can't find. Um, it it varies somewhat, but um, many many librarians make um, a comparable salary to what we're increasing to Sharon. Uh, some make more, some make a little less. Um, I do know for a fact that the Forbes li Library director is uh, woefully underpaid and that's a result of their board. Um, uh, I don't have the list. Sharon, do you recall looking through that list? No, I don't, and I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I printed it out. So Tim, but, my question is, when you considered this issue, I think you've answered it. Did you, did you look at comparable, did you look at- Yes, library? I did, I did. Okay, um, so that there was some effort to think about this in at least kind of three dimensions, right? So yes, one they, dimension, one dim I'm going to say what I understand and you tell me whether it's wrong. One dimension had to do with the town and where people are on the, on the, the steps and what happened when they did this reclassification. A second dimension has to do with the way in which Sharon's job has, uh, her responsibilities have dramatically increased with the work that needs to be done about uh, the building uh, project. And third is that you looked at the comparable library directors so that this recommendation comes from a kind of analysis at those three levels. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, the town actually did look at um, at the library directors, and I did print it out because as a former library director, I was curious, but I can't find it. Um, okay, but but you did but, you did look yep. at that. That's, yep. that's yep. what I wanted. Yep. Okay. And but the major thing is that. Um, Prior to this new scale, Sharon and many other town officials were just stuck at the top and they were only getting, you know, the 3% COLA. Um, and that's, uh, you know, Paul Bockelman did say that many staff, um, non-union staff were underpaid mm -hmm. relative to other towns and other communities. So, um, you know, we looked at this and, and where Sharon was and all of the work that she's been doing in addition to her regular job and felt that this was justified. Sure. Um, so uh, it is our recommendation that she on her anniversary be moved um, those three steps. So Nat, before you get in, I just wanted to say one other thing. I attended a meeting of the budget coordinating group and one of the things that came up in the budget coordinating group uh, was about the difficulty that the town is facing in filling certain positions in the town. And the sense was that this is a real issue for the town and that the town may not be um, effectively competing in the marketplace. Yeah. So another thing to think about is uh, if if we were if we were to be filling the library director's position, what would we have to offer, given the scope of responsibilities, uh, to compete in the market? Now, again, we're not. I hope Sharon's not planning to go anywhere, but that's another that's another way to think about. Um, yeah, yeah. Why, they, why they, one might want to do this? Okay. Uh, um, Paul Bockelman did comment that um, in order to fill certain positions, they would have to um, post uh, higher positions, higher uh, a higher level than what people who are would vacate the position yep. had been earning. Okay, Nat? Yes, um, I just wanted to speak to that because I was also interested in that same um, question and I found data on the um, MBLC website that had um, a little bit out of date, but I think 2023 salaries for library directors across the state. And also another one about 
the size of libraries and, and staffing levels and so forth. And then in the town study, I think there were I don't know, about 15 or so towns in our area of maybe comparable size or within a range um, that the consultants were looking at. So I went to see for those towns, um, what was the library director's salary? Um, what was the population that was also in the MBLC uh, spreadsheet? And then also um, what was the staffing level? And looking at, you know, comparing the um, salary level of the director to the size of the town, and also the library director's salary compared to the um, staffing level, right? How big of an operation is this? Yep. And especially on the staffing level, um, I found that of these towns, they ranged from um, $3,000 or so um, per full-time equivalent staff up to over $11,000 per full-time staff. And I was interested to see that Amherst was at the very, very bottom of this list. And it's somewhat correlated because I guess in general, you might expect a smaller library to hire a director, they would have to pay more per staff member, right? The size of the library. Um, but um, that was kind of a, a shock to me. And, and even though that data is a little bit old, I think that it it provides a lot of evidence that we, um, you know, for the size of our library, the size of our community, um, as well as the performance that Sharon has exhibited over um, the 13 years, um, really makes it uh, deserving of a um, of this three step increase. Thank you, Nan. Other questions or comments on the proposed motion to approve the library director's FY25 step increase. Okay, so on the motion to approve the FY25 proposed step increase from step five to step eight, uh, Nat, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Gene, how do you vote? Yes. Lee, how, how do you vote? Yes. Tammy? Yes. And Austin votes yes. And again, I want to thank you, Tammy and Bar. I mean, this is, um, uh, I, I appreciate the thoroughness with which you considered it and the uh, work that you did to uh, kind of look at the comps. And thank you, Nat, for the contribution to that conversation. Okay, more from the PPP, Tammy. Uh, that's all for today. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Next up, I think this is an exciting moment. <laughs> this is the first <laughs> report from the recently and wisely reconstituted <laughs> Budget <laughs> Investment Committee. So this is historic. Uh -huh, yeah. And folkloric. Yes. Okay. Here we are. Well, uh, we had we had our first ever meeting of the United Budget and Investment Committee, um, and you'll have to, you know, forgive me that I'm a brand new chair of a brand new committee, so I'm sure I don't have all the details down. But I think we have encouraged Sharon to commit a revolutionary act in terms of the budget presentation which I think she has done uh, in that, if you look at the long chart that follows, the summary comes first. Yes. So all of you on the trustees who want to uh, understand the budget, you can read the summary sheet. And then if you want, you can go down and get all the details. Uh, and typically the budget committee meeting uh, consists of, as I say, what you're looking at is, is a hybrid of a budget and a running list of expenses. And so it gets adjusted as the year goes on and some of the numbers move. And um, my intent in chairing this committee is to, to look at the summary and then to ask Sharon if there are any particular items she wants to draw our attention to 
and Nat and I will look and if we have questions, we will obviously raise them. But if you look at the summary sheet, in my view, it seems as though everything is proceeding in order and you know we're on track to end the year in good shape. And there's, depending on how the year unfolds, there may be large changes depending on what happens with the building project. But that's what we did and you can, you can see it here. And we invited the representative from Mercer, yep. Vanguard now Mercer, to come and we're meeting on Tuesday and I believe this person is coming on Tuesday? Not coming on Tuesday, can't come on Tuesday. Okay, well, at some point, he's going to come and we'll have a fuller discussion of where we are with Mercer and how we're proceeding with that. But again, I anticipate that things will just continue. And uh, the I don't have in front of me because I I forgot that we were now the budget and investment. So I didn't get the updated figures for the for the Vanguard for the Mercer account and our endowment and the Woodbury funds, but I'll have them for you for next, um, for our next meeting. But there's, you know, as the stock market market has been going, so have our accounts. So we're in good shape. Thank you. The questions for the budget and investment committee. So I have a couple of questions uh, or maybe an observation. Um, so the budget coordinating group for the town is a, I think, really terrific thing. Uh, it means that representatives from the library, representatives from the school, and of course the town uh, get to sit together and hear about the, the whole budget picture. So, you know, if you're in the library, you're worried about the library budget. And you're in the school, you worry about the school budget. And... I always find those conversations to be really instructive about um, the way the town does its budget business. And what I'm going to tell you, you already know, uh, but I raised a question about it in the, in the budget coordinating committee, and I want to raise it here. So the way the town, as I understand it, and Sharon can correct me, Nat can correct me, the way the town kind of does its budget business is it figures out what the raise in the budgets can be. It fixes what, in a preliminary way, what those raises can be. And then asks the schools, the library, the town to submit a budget with that increase. Mm -hmm. Sharon, is that accurate? So that means that for a while, the town has been committed to uh, a policy which uh, would say, um, to use a colloquialism from my junior high school at Providence, irregardless of the needs of any particular entity, you get to two and a half percent and mm -hmm. you, make, you make your thing work. And that has the advantage as I understand it, of um, ensuring that uh, the clerk's office is not competing with the schools, is not competing with the library for um, resources. Um, and I think it's been, from the point of view of the town and long as I've participated in it, a kind of good way to proceed because you, you know what you're going to get and then you you fit your budget to that thing. And as I understand it from the town, they like that approach because uh, we're under prop two and a half. There's only so much they can raise the budget ceilings. And they tell you what your budget ceiling is and they say, you know, figure out how you're going to do run your operation with, a, with that amount. Um, in, in the budget coordinating group, I think I heard a lot about unmet needs in the town. 
We've talked about one of them just now, uh, just before, with respect to, uh, when, as we were discussing, yeah, there is. step increase about unf unfilled positions and, and, you know, how are we going to compete in the marketplace? And there were many things mentioned in the budget coordinating group uh, that the town has not been able to uh, accommodate. Uh, in terms of the needs of the town. One thing that is perennially in front of this budget coordinating group is the differential need, uh, in particular, of the schools. So I raised a question um, in the budget coordinating group. Um, if we budget that way, are we, in a sense, this is the wrong word, hiding the real needs uh, of the library and of departments. Now, I think that the town manager probably has a sense of the real needs of the town departments. But if you start with two and a half percent and you're in a budget or two percent, whatever it is, you're in the budget coordinating group, you don't hear about the real needs of the water department or the, you don't hear about it. And I just raised the question about whether or not this, everybody gets the same thing, which has been in place for a while, is serving the town well, uh, or whether we ought to go to um, a budget process in which departments, the schools, the library articulates their real needs. And then a judgment could be made Maybe the judgment would be the same. That's fine. Everybody's going to get the same. But at least it would all be surfaced. And then the budget coordinating group would know what are the real needs of, you know, the engineering department or the building inspecting department or the this and the that, which we really don't at this, at this point. Now, why is that relevant here? It's relevant here because I think we need to make sure that as we go through the budget process, we are doing more than making it fit with the town cap. And whether we are able, whether we go to town and articulate, well, we're this is the way it would work for two and a half percent or whatever that cap is. If you really wanted to deal with the needs of the library, here's what they are: we would need four percent. So, you know, the issue of how the down budgets is above my pay grade, but whatever they do, I think as we go forward with budgeting, we want to just make sure that we are at least conversing about what the real needs of the library are, even if they would exceed in budget terms what we, the way in which we budget. Uh, I see... Uh, Trustee uh, Ely would like to speak. Um, I actually, uh, I don't know if it's appropriate now. I had one other comment in the PPP. It's kind of a generalized comment. So depending, I could make it now or make it later. Well, why, why, don't, you, why don't you make it now? Well, um, Eugene um, has been working on a flow chart for the library and the branches um, and various um, entities that participate and impact the library. So um, the committee were thought that was an interesting idea. It would be good for us for new members or for other people to understand the organizational flow and chart of the library. So he's working, he um, showed us sort of a model, but um, I, I meant to mention that, I forgot, so. Um, it, I don't, first of all, thank you, Jean, for doing it, but I'm not sure I understand what, could, Eugene, could you just say a little bit about what what you float? I mean, what do you what? What is flowing in this flow chart? It's not really a, a flow chart. It's more of a um, visual, visualization and, for want of a better word, inventory of the library system. Um, I've been caught up or caught out publicly a few times making statements, not fully understanding the structure. Um, and then I had seen, I think, in the newspaper about the Munson Library trustees. I didn't know there were trustees for the Munson Library, so we got into a discussion around. Well, there's trustees for the Munson Library. The Jones Library pays rent, 
but we don't pay rent for North Amherst. There, it's actually a fee and there's no trustee. So just there's no documentation. Um, so I just had started to kind of scroll some stuff down and yeah. started to put it in PowerPoint. Um, how we how we enrich that potentially with any kind of financial information, you know, that that certainly could be added on if, if that's kind of what um, Tammy is suggesting potentially, right? Uh, but just to kind of get an idea, like, what does it really look like? It's actually fairly complex, at least to me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for doing it. And thank you for, for letting us know you're doing it. Lee Edwards. Okay. I th I thought Tammy was going to speak to a point that I'm going to make, because she preceded me, I believe, on JCPC, the Joint Capital Planning Committee of the town, for which... I think I was very bad in some prior life for which I am the library's representative last year and this year. And my sense of what that group does is it does something like Austin, what you're suggesting, although, so JCPC is where various entities in the town, the library, although the library has not been participating while we, uh, and it's really only about capital planning, so That's it's right. Too. It's different, but it's a, but but the impulse is similar to what I think you're asking for, which is everybody comes in with what they say their needs are, and then the um, JCPC has a figure for what it's what the what the budget can be. And then it's a process that goes on where each department comes in and makes its case, the committee mulls and tries to trim down the um, requests usually, I, as far as I can tell based on my one year experience uh, to fit within what the town says it can afford. So, I mean, I think, um, I, I, I think the kind of thinking that you're recommending is, um, it's something that the town has applied in some in in some fashion, but not completely. And maybe it could think in in, in ways of putting those two processes together for capital projects and also uh, operating funds. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Sharon, oh, you're muted, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Austin, for like this. For bringing this topic up and and for that reminder so um we do have uh the ability we've always had the ability uh to talk about what our needs are but then as you said you know keep it to the two and a half percent increase but but we still are, are given a platform to discuss what our needs are i think that um the library historically has been very we're rule followers we um we want to be good colleagues with our other town departments. We understand that there are serious needs in all the different departments, and we don't want to be seen as taking too much of the pie. Um, and, and the fact that the library has other sources of funding that not all town departments have. So you combine all of this, all of this, stuff and and certainly just within jcpc you know at first we 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 didn't go to jcpc saying hey we know we're we're in line for this building project so you don't need to fix the roof right now because it that doesn't make any sense um so it's being fiscally responsible too that being said all of this being nice or or or, or not not taking advantage of of the platform, the opportunity to say, listen, our number one problem is not enough staff. Um, we don't have enough full-time staff and we have we have part-time staff that can come in and, and fill in when they can. And we're criticized for having too many part-time staff. And it was a, it's, that's just one example. Um, and our collections, you know, we have, 
it's like we're budgeting in reverse as, as opposed to what Austin is suggesting. And so I just thank you so much for, for bringing this up and um, making me like think differently about it. So it's good. Thank you. So again, I, I, I think the town's budgeting, I think they're, they do a really good job in the budgeting process. Uh, they're incredibly thorough. They, they seem to me to be very well informed. They make a very difficult process. I mean, it. you think, Gene, your flow chart or whatever it is, is complicated, right? Imagine the complications of putting together this budget. So uh, whatever happens in the town, you see, Sharon, you just said something that, I don't know when was the last time it was said in the trustees. We don't talk about our hours, we did, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, talk about our hours. So there are a whole variety of things that we might talk about if we budgeted on a need base as opposed to a revenue base. And uh, whatever's going to happen in the town uh, about budgeting going forward, and I don't know, Nat, I mean, I when I made my comment, I I didn't see the usual level of smiles that I get when I make suggestions. So I didn't think it was the, like this group thought, oh, that's the best suggestion I've ever heard. But whatever happens in the town, I'm just saying for the budget investment committee and the director, as we go forward, we need to kind of keep two sets of books. <laughs> One is the revenue-based budget and the other is the need-based budget. And you're right, Sharon, we can we can say whatever we want to say in the uh, in the budget coordinating group. And the schools certainly do. They don't, they don't, you know, it's not, they're not talking about their needs, they're talking about their needs all the time. But uh we have not made that part of our approach in that group. I'm not saying we should. But I'm saying that in this group, we should be looking at, you know, revenue based, but also need need based so that we can make sure that we're all informed about what the real needs of the library are as we produce these budget documents. OK. Lee Edwards. Yeah, I want to I mean, what you're talking about, obviously, would be. A, a change in procedure. It would also both require and if it works, produce a change in the sort of psychological mindset of the participating entities. And I, you know, in my past life, I had some experience both at UMass and more interestingly at five colleges where the deans all met together, the provosts all met together, the presidents all met together. And we learned, you know, even though in some sense we were in competition, we learned about the needs of the other places and being human beings, we gave each other ideas. We didn't, we didn't take this information and say, how can I use this information to attack you? We, tr we grew fond of one another and we, where we could, you know, tried to do what we could to help each other out. But, but we certainly grew to understand other people's, other entities who were in some sense in a competitive relationship with us. We, as we grew to understand what they were doing and how they felt about what they were doing, we became more sympathetic to them and the atmosphere changes. And when the atmosphere changes, you find you can do things that it didn't occur to you. You find more creative way to, ways to do things. So I think it's a wonderful idea. And if, if you know, if you can uh, get, be, because my, again, my sense from six months on JCPC is that each entity as I believe they used to say at Harvard, another rumor that I've heard, each tub on its own bottom. Yeah. Okay. 
well, it, it, okay, and then everybody can drown. So, it, it, you know, it would be better. This is a good moment to think, is there a different way that we could do things in the town that would be better for the town as a whole? Yeah, I, yeah, I um, again, I just want to be clear as I can be. I think the town is, I think the people in town hall are doing a really good job in managing the budget. Yes, I agree. My question had to do with if we went back to time immemorial and said, why did we shift, if we did, to a revenue-based approach to budgeting? And does it still work with where we are? In other words, the conditions mm -hmm. might have been such back then mm -hmm. uh, where the needs were different. So the other thing, that, and this is for us now, the other thing that I think might be helpful if we did this double budgeting kind of process is when we went out for an annual fund ask or a sammy's event other than just saying give to the library because you love the library here's what your giving would enable us to do that we are not now able to do uh, we could do the following programs that we'd like to do uh other things so as we continuously articulate the real needs of the library and by real needs i also mean the aspirations of the library when you and the friends and the development committee are out trying to solicit funds i don't know it'd be a little more exciting to actually be told you know instead of send your Five hundred dollars mm -hmm. because you love the library. You send you five hundred. You love the library. Mm -hmm. and help us do X X mm -hmm. X one. So, um, um, as we say it, I mean, good enough. That's enough on, for this. And you know, just uh, more more work, more work for the budget and investment <laughs> committee to do. <laughs> okay. Maybe so, it needs maybe it needs one more member. Well, that's I rule that out of order. Okay, Sharon, Sherry, uh, we don't have anybody from the Friends to make a report, so I think we're to you, the director's report. I don't have anything else to add. So I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit about what's going on in the library. I mean, <laughs> um, uh. Yes. So September always goes fast. So, um, you know, the summer reading program staff are crazy busy and and excited and it's fun. And then September comes and everybody gets a chance to breathe. And it's an it, Amherst is wild because there's an immediate switch. So it goes from people wearing shorts and T-shirts to uh, everybody's back in their suits and ties and kids are in session. And so we're filling out new library cards like crazy. Um, and and planning for fall for fall programming. It's again, staff kind of are on the edge of their seat now waiting for Halloween. Um, and so it so because the 31st is when the bid opening is. So they're still like planning programming is hard not knowing. So you know, they'll plan up through January and then we'll see what happens from there. So, you know, overall, the branches are going great. We have staff members that are going to have babies, which is awesome. Um, so exhaustion and good and yeah. What can you say about the 106 process? Uh, so yeah, all the information is out there. So much information is out there. We are absolutely being, you know, guided by uh, the legal uh, regulations that are set before us. Everything is, um, everything's in line properly and all of the, you know, the proper uh, timeline for public comment ha has been in place. So uh, really all our ducks are beautifully in a row. And um, I, I think because we'll have this facilitator um, that, uh, they will oversee, make sure that not one person dominates and everybody gets a chance to say. And um, and then public comment, we encourage more public comment, but even after the meeting, there's, you know, where we encourage people to continue to 
to send in the public comment, you know, once they like think about what happened during the meeting and what, what was said. So um, I, I, we're in a really good place. It's all, um, yeah, we're in a really good place. And, you know, regarding the participants of them, it, the process is, is that we open it up, we tell everybody and people self-select. So this wasn't us saying, you know, we think you need to be a consulting party and you need to be a consulting party. This is different groups. It, it, it's up to them to say whether or not they want to participate. So that's how the whole the whole thing rolled out. And normally there's only a, a handful of consulting parties, but in, but in this case, there's a lot of really interested uh, parties. So it's great that we can, really the technology, the fact that we can do this on Zoom, it helps for enormous participation. So um, yeah. I think, unless you have any other questions. I do, I have a couple. And the determination of adverse impacts uh, involves, among other things, thinking about the effect of what we're going to do on the surround. It's not just about the library, like what's the adverse impact in the library. Do you want to say a word about that? Because I don't think a lot of people quite maybe understand that that they yeah like uh you know what, what, what are you going to do with the whipple window which is of course important concern so do you want to just say a little bit more about that sure so the area of, of potential effect there are uh two different historic districts that were a part that were in so we're, we're not a, a standalone we are in on the national register because we are in these districts um and so when looking at the potential effects due to the project on these historic districts, you, you look at the exterior. And so there is a map and and depending on where where you're standing within the district and you're looking at the at the Jones Library, what changes can you or can you not see? And for the most part, you you really the architects have done such a great job from Amity, you're not you're not seeing things. Um and so yeah, uh, so all, all of that is taken into consideration, not just the library. Not just what's going on on the inside of the library. Right. On the library, it's this, the impact on other historically significant yeah. um, uh, properties and uh, properties and activities. Yeah, yeah. And the, the town is running this process. This is not the library running this process. The town produced a very long and detailed um, letter, including a preliminary, if I would call it, determination of adverse effects. We think these are the adverse effects and those are the adverse effects. And as I understand it, under the standards, uh, we are not required to avoid any adverse effect, but rather to, among other things, adequately mitigate the adverse effect and to locate the adverse effect in relationship to improvements in the functioning of the of the library is that accurate absolutely so i think what what is confusing to people is is the thought that you must uh adhere to this list of standards and and that's that's simply not the case um the, the standards are there for a reason so that you can you can you know be aware of an effect to something. But then the beauty of the 106 process is, okay, so how are we going to mitigate those uh, adverse effects? So it's not that you can't. And, and, and that trickles down to, you can even take down entirely a building that's on the national register. It, um, because uh, the, the, the way the standards are, are evaluated, it depends. Every case is different. Every building is different. Every financial uh, resource that's available to any institution is different. And so the process is there not to stop these kinds of rehabilitation projects, which is exactly what this is. This is a beautiful rehabilitation project that is going to highlight what it can of the 1928 portion. And it's gonna bring a sustainability, uh, a, a sustainable portion to the building that we cannot have the way it stands. And it 
And because this process has taken 10, 11, 12, 13 years, the, the, uh, the amount of, of time for public comment and changes, changes have been occurring. If you look at the plans now versus what they were in 2016 when we applied for the grant, they're night and day. And so much of that is because of public comment. It's been great. Um, so so really the, the process is when you follow it, quite fair. And, right. and go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to focus a little bit on what you just last said. And I want to make sure I, I'm saying it correctly. The process of mitigating adverse effects to the historical preservation interest in the library has been going on for years. Uh, that doesn't make the 106 process any the less significant. But it's important to understand that the 106 process, which is required because of funding that we are seeking to get, is part of a large context in which we have made changes to mitigate adverse effects to the historical integrity of the process. And I'm going to mention two. One is the stairway that uh, we imagine we would take out. And members of the public uh, said, that's a mistake. And they explained why it was a mistake. And that was changed. That was years ago. Another, I don't know, example perhaps of mitigating an adverse effect came up in the work that we did this summer, yes. where the original idea was to not put the historic mill work back. And members of the public uh, said that's a that's a mistake oh that's and members of the building committee said that's a mistake and then we said okay historic mill work so uh the process of understanding the impact on the historical integrity of the building has been going on for a very long time and changes have been made to mitigate the adverse effects and I take it that that's part of the story that um, people need to understand when we come to a, a memorandum of agreement, memorandum of understanding um, at the end of this 106 process, uh, we will be responding uh, to what we've heard in the 106 process, but in the broader context of the mitigation efforts that we've already undertaken and the relationship between those mitigation efforts and the vast improvements that are going to make, which will enhance and preserve uh, this, this library. Is that accurate? It's perfect. Yeah. Well, with, with the phrase perfect, I think I'll stop talking. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Sharon? All right. I think we are, um, we are ready to adjourn. Thank you, everybody. Stay well. Have a good weekend. Okay.